Hello, YouTube friends. I hope you can hear me. And uh, let's see here. A few little adjustments. Now, if you can hear me, mention it on the chat that we have good sound. Let's see here. Do we have good sound, everybody? Waiting for some kind of a sound check sound. Sound check sign. Sounds great. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And, um, of course, I'm Ben Ochart, and today is... Cichlids and coffee. <laughs> and wherever you are, I hope you're watching with one of these. And um, drinking out of one of those cups. And if not, uh, that's okay, too. I hope you're enjoying your coffee, your tea, or whatever your morning beverage of choice is. And uh, we have a lot to talk about today. And uh, so I'm going to be getting right into it. But first, let me go ahead and uh, do the usual shout-outs. I want to give a big shout-out to the... Uh, to the moderators, the best moderators on YouTube, Denny Riddell, Kevin Green, and of course the amazing Candy. Thank you, thank you to all three of you for doing a great job on these uh, on these live streams, and uh, have been have been through it uh, from the beginning with me through the uh, ups and downs and through the uh, mistakes and uh, all the other stuff that comes with starting to starting a live stream. You know, you kind of learn as you go. And so they have uh, stuck, hung in there, stuck in there with me. I appreciate it. So um, also a big shout out to those of you who are coming from very, very far away places. I know last week we had uh, Les Jones in Scotland. We had Sergio Moreno in Sweden. And uh, let's see, we had, uh, we had several folks that were from other, like far away, odd time, time, uh, time zone areas. I appreciate that. And of course, Tom adding uh, in Malibu, California, uh, in a very, in a very different uh, time zone. Uh, thank you, Tom. And I am going to take you up on your invitation for a uh, dinner or lunch at Neptune's net. When I get down there, you made the mistake of saying that on the uh, last, uh, last week's chat. And I, I do remember I'm going to take you up on it. So, um, and thank you to super chatters last week's super chatters. Uh, I think we had, um, uh, Posey Wee, Kaler's Aquatics, Cichlid Dan, uh, GP, Gurvinder Parmar, and uh, and Clinton A. Uh, all of you, thank you so much for your Super Chats. Uh, I did send out stickers to last week's Super Chats. I appreciate uh, I appreciate you folks. Those stickers are in the mail. That you, they, If you haven't received them, you'll get them in the next couple of days. So... Um, for those of you who don't know, super chatting, of course, is a way for you to be able to support the live stream and and my uh, my my obsession. Another way to support the obsession, of course, is to pick up some uh, some gear. And I do have the hoodies now. The hoodies are now available. I couldn't figure out at Teespring how to lower the price, so I've created a temporary code. The code that you see on the uh, screen right now is good for ten dollars off of the hoodie. You can try using it with the live stream code, and that way you'll get 10% plus the 10, uh, the $10. I'm not sure if they'll do that, but give it a shot. It might be, it'd be worthwhile. Um, how does this work? It cuts, it, it cuts back what they give me. So um, this is sort of my gift to those of you who support the channel. If you want a hoodie, uh, go ahead. This will be the time to order it. This, this code will be good for, I don't know, probably till probably maybe middle of February, we'll leave the code up and uh, 10 bucks off. I'm not sure if you can use it on other stuff because it would be below, below, below cost. I don't think they would allow that, but I think they would allow it on the hoodie, a $10 uh, discount using that code exactly the way it shows the one QWB seven BU six, five, eight. So uh, if you want to order a hoodie, go ahead and write that down. So um, let me see here. I'm trying to figure out why my main screen isn't showing the chat. I have to turn partially around to see the chat and to see what's going on, but that's okay. So you'll be getting a lot of profile shots today. So um, I want to, um, 
let's talk a little bit about what's been going on. And for those of you who follow the channel, you know that I've I've been uh, releasing videos on a pretty steady steady basis. I, I warned you that if I went into semi-retirement or retirement, I would start getting more content out, and that's exactly what's happened. I've um, I've changed a work schedule where I'm working primarily from home and uh, the work that I do, and it's on a more limited basis. What that does, is it does give me more time to come up with uh, crazy ideas that I can put into a video and, and, and release for you folks. And um, so you're going to be seeing more of that. And last, of course, and since the last last stream, since the last live stream, I released uh, the, the Hawk Hotel, the the room upgrade that a lot of you made some jokes about, which I liked. Uh, they, they they got a uh, you know they were upgraded to a suite. Uh, you know where's where's the chocolate? Uh, where are the flowers? Blah blah blah. So anyway, still no activity in there. The male hawk is looking a little bit fired up. Uh, the female is still being very docile and laid back. I did see. Uh, despite my clearing out a large area and making it uh, bare bottom, they, they made a big pit. There's a big pit now in the front left corner of the tank. Uh, they've moved a tremendous amount of the substrate around. So maybe that's a sign. Maybe something is going to be uh, going on. And so fingers crossed. I'm definitely going to give them, uh, you know, probably another month or two and just see just see if something happens and and. Uh, so we'll be, uh, I'll be putting out more uh, Malawi Hawk Hotel updates in the future. The, um, uh, I also, of course, released a, a video on a full detailed walkthrough of the sump. And um, so, uh, and I did get a good response to that. Uh, the sump is, the, one of the fun things about uh, having a sump is, uh, is that it's, it's, a, it's always a work in progress. And by that, what I mean is, you can, you're always having fun with it. You're always tweaking and trying this and trying that and not too extreme, but um, because, you know, something's working and, and my stuff is certainly working, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you can fine tune it. You can try a little this, try that, move a thing around, you know, like I've done, I've uh, put some large stand up sponges, threw some shrimp in there. Uh, you know, you, you can do little things like that. And it's, it's always a kind of a, a fun work in progress, which is part partly what makes having a sump uh, so enjoyable. And I certainly recommend it. I think it's created some excitement about sumps in the freshwater, among some of the freshwater viewers that normally sumps uh, are thought of in very large tanks and, uh, and certainly in the salt community. But I've seen some excitement among uh, some of the uh, uh, you know, more folks who normally would not even have considered a sump. So, um, and, and, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there are a lot of ways, certainly there are ways to add a sump to a tank, not just with having a drill tank. You don't necessarily have to have a drill tank. Um, <clears throat> also, of course, I, I did a, a, a brief comparison on a sump uh, versus a canister, and uh, they both definitely have their, their, uh, their role in the hobby. I enjoy, and I like both of them, and um, if I had to have one, Probably the biggest concern I would have with a canister would be that um, it doesn't have the safeguards necessarily that a sump has. I have a lot of safeguards built into the sump in the tank behind me that would prevent a uh, a, a a flood in the event of a, of a uh, uh, you know in the event of some, something going wrong or you know like like the motor the pump burning out or something. Uh, but it, let's say that the canister, let's say a canister hose uh, came loose a little bit. Uh, you know, because of its position, it would es essentially drain all the way to the bottom of your intake. It would just keep draining and draining and draining and draining. And so there is a uh, there is a risk with a canister. And of course, you have that risk, of course, if, if, if you had your sump crack, let's say, or break open, or let's say you're using a glass tank as your sump, and one of those seams, you know, that some of the silicone came loose or something. Uh, so you have that risk anywhere. The only the other thing I don't like necessarily about canisters is that they they are work they are work to to break down to clean uh, there there's a lot of work involved and so um, my solution for that has been to add pre filters to 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 catch some of the detritus on the front end and that way uh, be able to extend the amount of time 
between the uh, the canister maintenance. Uh, the canisters on my uh, 60 gallon, I have two, two canisters on there plus a hang on pack. So the work is spread out across three different, three different units. And so that puts a very light load on each of them. And so the uh, time between uh, canister maintenance, I mean, it could be four or five months uh, between, or, or maybe even six months between when I have to crack open one of those Sunsun 302s. So um, it, it sort of solved that problem. The uh, Fluval on the 100 being the only filter uh, on the 100 is, is has a, bit, a very big load that, that it has to handle. And so even with that large sponge filter I picked up from Corey, I still need to crack that thing, you know, at least, well, I crack it every month to replace the floss at the very top center. I have some pinky in there. And at least maybe every three or four months, I have to crack it and give it a cleaning uh, only because uh, it's handling all of the load. I think if I put another hang on back on there uh, or maybe even a second canister or maybe uh, eventually put a small sump in place, that that uh, fluval will be able to go for a lot longer without necessarily um, needing uh, ne needing to be serviced. Uh, what makes it a good canister? The fact that it pushes a lot of water is also what makes it very uh, much in need of regular maintenance because it's you know it's capturing a lot of a lot of waste. I will say that when I open it up, since I started using the uh, pre filters, the the outside sponges are in better shape. The inside media looks better. And as long as I'm swapping out that piece of pinky in the top center at least once a month, it seems to be staying in pretty good shape. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, you know, keep monitoring it and see. I will say that I am happy with the uh, use of the pre-filters. Uh, my, my only advice on them is to go ahead and rinse them in tank water with each water change, which for me is every week. I pull them out. I have a bucket that I've put partial tank water in. And I give them a good rinse, and then I put them back on. And uh, they're doing a great job, especially with those 302s. When I opened up those 302s and I filmed it, somebody told me that I had lied, that I had filmed it after I had cleaned them, <coughs> which I thought was kind of comical. But um, anyway, they're doing a great job on keeping those 302s in in, uh, in, in good shape and catching a lot on the pre-filter. The other reason I love the pre-filter and I see it in action after every feeding is that the uh, you can you can see the fish picking off food that um, would have normally been sucked directly into the canister. The food will collect on the outside of the sponge, and the fish will go ahead and just pick it off of there. So uh, that I think is a bit more efficient use of your food. So um, those were the the uh, the videos that were released and. Let's take a look at uh, what I have coming up here. There's a coming up, and one of them was inspired by uh, Sharpies and uh, let me see what's his full name, Sharpies models, and uh, you know he he made some uh, he or she I can't assume really uh, Sharpies models and aquatics made some comments in the in the uh, last live stream having to do with um, you know questioning bringing into question. Uh, the the use of expensive, uh, you know, well marketed uh, media, and whether or not that's even needed, I've reached out to a couple folks uh, in you know respected fish keepers in the community. I've I've posed the question to them. I've asked for some of them to participate in upcoming videos to get their take on it. Uh, I just thought it was a very um, a provocative uh, and disruptive uh, kind of question that I think is good. It's good for the for the hobby to get some dis disruptiveness occasionally if it moves us in the direction of being better fish keepers, and possibly saves us some money. And uh, you know, I'm always looking at doing it properly, but also not not wasting money. And so I have a video coming out coming uh, called uh, "What If It's All Baloney," and uh, that wasn't the original title. The original title was "What If It's All Something Else." But a couple of folks suggested I, I I toned that down a little bit, <laughs> and uh, so it's going to be what if it's all baloney, and uh, and I'm going to discuss uh, do we really need uh, you know 50 square miles of media, and uh, or can it be accomplished? Could it be accomplished with sponges 
and uh, and the substrate that we have in the tank could that possibly and actually be enough for um, for sustaining the, the beneficial bacteria that's needed certainly if you have some comments on that subject go ahead please go ahead and 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 note them in the chat I'd love to see them and I may even include them in the upcoming video because all I have so far on that video is the thumbnail that you're seeing on the screen right there. And um, I don't really have that, but I'm waiting to hear back from some of these uh, fish keepers whose names I'm gonna keep private until I hear back from them. But I wanna get it more formulated before I put it out. But if you have comments on it, I would like to hear them. I'd love to hear, have you put them below. Either right now in the live stream or uh, later in when the video posts uh, to uh, to YouTube, uh, the other the other video that I'm going to be um, coming out with, which ties into today's topic, is uh, you know very often what drives my topics uh, for videos, both for live streams and things I'm releasing, are the current events. You know what's going on right now with me and my fish keeping, and uh, you know for quite some time now. Uh, and, and the theme of this something is wrong video that you see the, the thumbnail for, 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 for quite some time now, I have had two or three fish that continue to be very active. They continue to be very, um, they eat well, they look good, they have good color, but they have a slight, a slightly concave stomach. And, um, uh, I'm going to be going over this with you and in more detail and talking to you about which fish I'm referring to in the upcoming video and uh, and also with some suggestions on what to do about it. I'm going to move one piece of equipment over. Okay, so let's see here. That's a little better. I can see more what's going on. And we have, it looks like we have 67, it says on my, this computer. So uh, you folks, you, you, should be you should be sharing this now. You should be sharing this, this live stream. <laughs> Get on the phone. <laughs> Sh share the link and... Uh, Okay, so at any rate, so there's a there's a few fish that, and, and maybe you've had this happen, and if you have had this happen, share it below. I wanna hear about your experience. And again, the, the, the video is a work in progress, so um, I, I may draw on uh, some of your comments, but the, um, let's see here, there we go. Okay, I wanna, I wanna find out if you have had a fish that for a long period of time was fine. In other words, it showed no signs, no signs of anything else except a slightly concave stomach. You could never get that fish to fatten up. Even though all the tank mates were nice and round and fat, this, this one fish always had this slightly concave stomach. So I'd like to hear what if, if that's happened to you and also what was your conclusion? What was your, and, and, and did you resolve it? Were you able to handle it? Uh, in, in my case, I mean, there's various factors. There's various factors that can come into play. You can have bacteria. You can have some bacteria that, that, that's at work. Now, in, in, in the web pages that I visited and the, and the research that I did and, and the blogs that, that, I, that I read, if it's bacteria, the fish usually doesn't last. The fish will usually, uh, and is more likely to 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 bloat than they are to 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 waste away. So, but there were places on the web that said that bacteria can sometimes cause a, a concave in the stomach, a slightly concave stomach. the 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 majority of the opinion was that there is a parasite that is at work, and though not being deadly. Is is having an impact on the fish, and then the third opinion. The, the other opinions were things like genetically, that fish might actually just 
have that type of a predisposition, that type of shape genetically, that, that you may have a fish that is somehow shaped that way. Like some people are a little bit more pear shaped and some people are a little bit more V shaped. And you know, that the fish is just sort of shaped that way genetically or uh, that the fish is not being allowed to get to the food because they're so subdominant, they're so low in the pecking order that they can't get to enough food. They're getting to just enough food to keep them alive, but they're not getting to enough food to really, really satiate and meet their needs. Or the fish is living under, which I guess ties into the other one, uh, is living under a constant and steady amount of stress because it's being um, either harassed heavily or, or, or constantly chased or something. And because of that, the, the parasites, the immune system of the fish is being compromised because of the stress. And so it's fired up in that fish, but not fired up in other fish. So there's different theories floating around about that. And um, I, I, I think I, I might as well just go to the next slide because it's, uh, let me see, I'm already into the main subject here. But th that's, th that's really what, what, uh, uh, what prompted that, that video uh, coming out. And um, I'll get back to this. I'll get back to this when we get into diseases. But I do have, I also want to just change the subject slightly and I'll come back to it in a minute. And I'm going to be doing some uh, some product reviews as well, and uh, the product reviews have to do with uh, some things that I recently acquired. Th th these were not sent to me. I'm not sponsored by this product. This is a uh, a, a Cobalt Aquatics uh, Rescue Air, And the rescue air and and the video is going to be entitled "Could This Save Your Fish?" And uh, having had a situation personally where I lost a lot of fish due to a lack of oxygen, and based on what I've heard, if you ever have a power outage, the thing that kills your fish first is a lack of oxygen. So I'm going to be releasing a video where I actually test this uh, this product, which I picked up from my friends over at Super Cichlids. Super Cichlid sells these. And uh, and if you use um, if you go to the Facebook page, and you're a Facebook member at the Ben O, ben o apostrophe Cichlid Facebook group page, go into the group guidelines, and there's a code there that you can use that gets you uh, like a 12 percent discount at uh, Super Cichlids, and uh, they also I think they also it's either or I think they get or you can get free shipping. But very often, if you have a big enough order, the discount code is much bigger than the shipping, which is like five bucks or something. So uh, use that code. But at any rate, I'm going to do a review on this. I'm going to have it uh, working on an outside tank. I'm going to be filming it, and I'm going to cut off the power, and we're going to see what happens. And uh, apparently, it can run for 72 hours once it's fully charged, which uh, that's better than, than a lot of your power packs you know, your power packs that you can plug your equipment into that kick in in a power outage. Uh, very few of them can go 72 hours. A lot of them just go just a few hours. So uh, I'm excited about this. It also has an adapter where you can plug it into your car's uh, cigarette lighter. So if you want need to transfer fish in a bucket or in a, you know, some, some kind of a bin, you need to take them somewhere, you can have oxygen going on. And uh, of course, that keeps the fish happier. You want to stress your fish, cut out their oxygen. And uh, so I'll be doing a review on that. So watch for that. And also, this is a sponsored product. And I haven't reviewed it yet. My only comment on it as of right now is that it's darn cute. <laughs> it's called an external hanging filter. I guess just an HOB, right? A hang on back from China. And uh, if you can see it with the glare. And uh, this thing is just, uh, uh, it's just darn adorable. And... Uh, <laughs> They sent it to me and they asked me if I wanted to do a review on it. I said, sure, why not? And uh, it, it has uh, it has this, this cool, uh, nicely shaped cover. And I'm going to run this in the same tank outside, the same little 10-gallon uh, QT tank that I have. I'm going to run this in, there, in that tank uh, during the same time when I'm testing that uh, rescue air from Cobalt. You see it's kind of a nicely shaped, uh, elegant cover. And, uh, you know, it's got your standard little 
impeller and uh, a sponge that you simply rinse and reuse forever. And uh, one of the things I liked about like about it right away is that it comes with that uh, you can control the flow. You can you know you can turn the flow up or down, and it comes with a it, it comes with this, with a little uh, you know with with a little pre filter that goes over it. So you know I think it'd be perfect for uh, for a uh, fry a little fry tank. And uh, or maybe just setting up an emergency tank. I could hang this on the outside of the of a sump, let's say, and just have it running all the time, so it's fully seeded and has beneficial bacteria, and just just pop it into a a, a QT tank, a hospital tank, and you're good to go. So I'll be testing those things and then letting you know what I think. And uh, so watch for that. And uh, that second product was sent to me for free to do a review on it. Full disclosure. So uh, that's what's coming up. That's what's coming down the pike. And I have something else that's very special. On uh, Sat on Saturday, uh, the 15th of February, I'm going to be going down to uh, Nolan's, Nolan's Aquarium. And you can see the address there, 2004 South Yale Street. I'm going to be going there and doing the live stream uh, from Nolan's shop. And uh, I haven't quite figured out where in the shop I'm going to set up. He's got a beautiful uh, centerpiece aquarium that, you know, you can, you know, you can walk all around. It's, it's tall. I think that might be a good place, a good backdrop. But I'm going to be there. And the live stream will go, um, we're thinking, uh, from 10 to 11, usual time. And then at 11, he'll open up the shop. And I'll be there if you folks want to come by and just do a little meet and greet and, and say hi. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hang out for a little bit. And uh, Nolan has, he, I'm not going to hold him to it because he alluded to it, but he hasn't confirmed it. But uh, it does sound like he is going to be offering a store-wide, uh, a huge discount, like 25% or something, uh, store-wide in conjunction with doing the live stream from his shop. So if you're in Southern California on the uh, 15th, Saturday the 15th, uh, around 11 a.m., come by. Uh, I'd love to meet you in person. We can uh, shake hands and say hello. And, um, and the uh, live stream will have a very different backdrop. Will be, uh, the backdrop will be Nolan's Aquarium. So that, that could be a lot of fun. So um, that's what's coming up. And I am, making, I am making arrangements for some live streams from some other locations as well. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So, getting back to today's topic, and uh, there there are so many uh, different diseases that we could get into and talk about that uh, I would probably need a. Um, I would probably use a. I probably need to do a five hour, uh, a marathon, a marathon live stream to really get into all of them. I wanted to uh, concentrate primarily on on this idea of the sunken belly, because the sunken belly and bloat, you have these two different issues that tend to occur, sunken belly and bloat. And, um, you know, you, especially with, with, with cichlid keepers who are feeding very protein-rich, very protein-rich food to their fish, it's very uh, easy, and especially if that fish is under any kind of stress, for that fish to become bloated, uh, to have its its intestinal tract blocked, and they get into a bloat. And bloat is, um, I mean, you you can certainly, you know, like fast, you, know, you can starve the fish a little bit, you can put some vegetables, some veggies into the diet. I mean, there's different things people try. Uh, once that fish starts to get pretty bloated, it's it's very seldom that I'll, that I'll hear that somebody was able to save the fish. It seems to be rather fatal, and it could actually, um, and often, probably more often than not, probably includes also some bacteria, some bacterial infection, and so it's it's a very bad scene when it happens. Uh, Adam C. Some of you are familiar with the uh, the YouTuber Adam C. He recently, in one of his recent videos, gave the tip that uh, one of the ways that he's been able to prevent bloat 
in his mind, what he think what what he thinks uh, has worked for him, because he did, I believe he did. He ran into some of it a while back, and it it cost him some good fish, and so he started figuring, trying to figure out what to do. But for him, he said that um, pre soaking, pre soaking the uh, cichlid food, softening it, and making it easier to digest, has he feels has worked for him because since he started doing that, he hasn't uh, he hasn't really experienced it. He hasn't had a uh, bloat occur. So maybe he's on to something. That certainly doesn't change the um, percentage of protein. The, 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 and if that's, being, if that's hard to digest for the fish, uh, you, know, you, you need the protein. They are, they are, these are carnivores. Some are omnivore. Uh, I don't keep any herbivore, you know, any, but uh, I do include... Uh, the way I've been working it is I do fast them uh, usually once a week. I'll just skip a feeding and uh, let their digestive system uh, clean out. And I also will include uh, a day of, of veggie feeding. And by veggie feeding, I mean uh, things like spirulina. And I just picked up some, some veggie pellets, some Northfin veggie pellets, uh, which is um, – when I made my when I placed my order with Super Cichlids, if your order is large enough, they offer you a free gift. And in my case, it was a it was a pretty good size, like a 250 gram size of uh, you know, 250 bag of uh, the veggie pellets. So once a week, they'll get a day of veggie, and uh, that's good for two reasons. One, it 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 helps to clean out the digestive tract. There is some protein in that veggie. Uh, formula, so they're not being starved of protein entirely, and um, it, it it helps with the it helps with the proto protomelis. I have protomelis, um, you know your your uh, super red empress, my uh, fire hap, uh, you know fish like that. Those those need they need veggie in the diet, and so that's my way of getting getting some greens into it. And I even have some of uh, Ron's, uh, I believe it's Ron's pellets. Uh, Ron's pellets. These are these green uh, pellets. Yeah, I've got them right here. These are pellets that are, uh, they, they have probiotics in them. You can see them. I'm not sure if you can make them out. How I can show them to you with the camera, where the camera is. But they're um, green they're green pellets. They're a uh, good size. They look like rabbit food. The, um, you know, hamster food. They, uh, they cloud the tank for about 10 minutes. For about 10 minutes, you'll have a cloudy tank. But, um, and they have them in a, in a, uh, a probiotic and a, a very strong spirulina uh, and probiotic formula, which is a little bit darker. And they have a, a, a lighter veggie formula. I've been using those for a while. And I'm sorry, I said Ron's. I take it back. Ken's. Ken's. I don't know why I said Ron's. But Ken's Premium Spirulina Sticks and also Ken's Premium Vegetable Sticks. Those are the two products at Ken's. And so I've been using those for a while. And the fish, even the... the uh, the predator, the big, the carnivores, you know, the, the real, the meat eaters, they love these sticks and they just, man, they just cram them in their mouths. And of course the, uh, the plecos love them as well. And so I, I recommend them. And uh, you will at first be a little bit uh, upset because you'll see the clouding. You go, what's going on here? It clears up in about 10 minutes. It's gone. The clouding is all gone. So uh, don't let that dissuade you. So um, getting back to disease, the sunken belly, um, the fish that I, that I have with the sunken belly, I'm going to be doing uh, some treatment in, in my consensus throughout the web. First of all, I, I ran across people who said, don't worry about it. If it's been going on for years and the fish continues to eat aggressively, act normal, has good color, uh, don't over don't overthink it. it it's just it's probably just the just the way that fish is that fish looks that's the 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 morphology of that fish right that's the genetic strain of that fish so that was some of the consensus uh, 
so, but, but to sort of err on the side of caution, I went ahead and I ordered some of this from Super Cichlids. I've got uh, Metroplex, Metro, and I've got Focus. So I've got Metro and Focus. I'm going to be uh, soaking some of the foods. I'm going to be soaking some of the foods in, in, uh, in that combination as suggested on the packets. And, um, and we'll see. We'll see if it makes a difference. I'll do a couple rounds and let's see if, if those fish actually, after doing that, let's see if they fatten up. There was one, uh, one word of, uh, one word of uh, caution on the Metro that someone voiced was that it could have a uh, impact on the beneficial bacteria. But when I asked Corey about that, when he was uh, live down in Costa Mesa, he said, no, he's never seen, he's never seen antibiotics or medications actually impact the beneficial bacteria in a way that was, um, uh, you know, destructive or detrimental or created some kind of a tank crash or a spike in ammonia. I will be, uh, after the treatment, I will be uh, pr probably picking up some of that CCAM matrix activated carbon or maybe just some regular activated carbon and then going ahead and dropping that into the filters and just to, just to, just to suck up the residual meds when I'm done. We'll see if it makes a difference. It may or may not. I may just have fish that are that are shaped that way. That's just the way they are, and I may have to just live with it. And you'll see in the upcoming video what fish I'm talking about, and uh, you can then make a judgment and and give me your opinion on whether you think that fish is uh, is carrying around a parasite or some type of a low grade bacterial disease, or whether that fish is just simply uh, shaped that way. So we'll see, and we'll see if the Metro has any kind of a positive or negative impact. I also had a comment under one of my um, posts when I announced the subject of today's live stream. Somebody commented that uh, they had just lost, I believe, 50% or more of their stock to a cholomeris infection. And I think that'll be uh, the only other one I'm going to talk about today. But Colomaris, I have had personal experience with it, as you know, if you are a fan of the channel. And um, I, I hated to hear that from that person because it is very devastating. And it kills in, in ways that are uh, uh, inconsistent. In other words, one fish will show the signs. He'll have uh, rot and, and, and white pus and fungus around the mouth. And on the, uh, you know, on the dorsal, on the tail, he'll have a saddle, a strap, or a lack of coloration from the back of the dorsal down the body, uh, down to the anal fin, and we'll have all these signs, and that fish survives. And the other fish that had no signs, and you were thinking was going to survive, all of a sudden just tips over and dies because the cholomeris attacked the fish internally and just destroyed the organs without showing outward signs. So it's a very, very um, nasty and very aggressive disease that if you ever suspect you have it, you need to immediately get into, and this is, this is my take on it. If you have a different opinion, mention it below because I, I, as I say, we learn from each other. But you need to get your hands on as strong as a fish antibiotic a gram negative, gram negative, that's important, that you can get your hands on and get it into those fish right away and uh, treat the tank, uh, put it in the food. You can buy food on eBay that, that has medication, gram negative medication. Uh, do, you know, just, just bomb the tank with a, uh, you know, powerful gram negative antibiotic. Do not mess around with your, um, you know, with your light herbal this or herbal that or natural this or all natural, gentle this or gentle that. I did that and it cost me about 50% or more of my stock before I got it under control uh, because I was, I was taking a, a more gentle approach. This will not respond to a gentle approach whatsoever. Colomaris is, uh, is something that will just 
it'll just run away and it'll get uh and the more you wait the more aggressive it gets it, it it's sort of it's it's just a nasty nasty uh disease so uh keep uh keep some uh furon uh keep some api general cure general cure did not do much for it i think general cure tries to be a little bit of everything to everybody uh, you're probably better off with some furon or maybe even some metro something very as strong as you can get uh, i use some fritz uh antibiotic and it it, it stopped it cold and, and uh so don't mess around with colomeris if you suspect it even the second you see any kind of a white uh you know build up on on the end of the fins any kind of a stripe a vertical stripe on the body, anything on the lips that looks like fungus or anything, immediately get on the internet and start start Googling diseases and you'll you'll start to you'll find matches and you'll come across blogs. And uh, uh, my my the best advice I can give you is act fast, really, really fast, because once it gets a hold, um, the fish just start tipping over. And um, imagine waking up every morning and walking to your tank and finding two or three fish dead um, for for about a week. Like every morning, there's two or three that are just upside down and gone. Very bad period. My fish keeping very close to knocking me out of the hobby for a while. I said, maybe it's time for a break, but I didn't. And so um, definitely a learning experience, definitely something that I came away with, with a very big, a very big takeaway. Um, so, on disease, two tips, use available resources right away. Medicate as quickly as possible. Ideally have medications on hand. Do watch the expiration dates on your medications because if you have them on hand, but you've let them expire, they're not gonna be any good. And the biggest tip, biggest tip I can give you is um, excellent uh, husbandry, excellent, fish husbandry, excellent fish keeping. In other words, uh, really stay on top of your maintenance, you know, keep your, your filters well-maintained, keep your san keep your substrate uh, clean and vacuumed, vacuum under decor. Uh, apparently something like Colomeris, uh, one of the theories is, is that it will um, it will start on, on feces, it'll start on droppings, on poop. That's where it'll start to grow and, and multiply and uh, and uh, so ever since that happened, I move decor around, I get under decor and I do find pockets, pockets where in an otherwise clean or good looking tank, all of a sudden you, you, you move a little piece of decor to the side, left or right a little bit, or you pick it up and you find this ball, this ball of crap. And, and, and it has been basically a Petri dish. A, 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 it's been basically a home where bacteria was 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 growing and multiplying and and so um, just just watch for that stay on top of that because uh, the best treatment for the disease of course and you know this is to never get it at all is to preemptively stay on top of things and uh, really stay on top of your 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 maintenance your water changes your vacuuming and and realize that there are spots in the tank. For example, behind this uh, behind this uh, 3D background, uh, I'm gonna have to pull that thing back because I'm pretty sure that there's an accumulation of some things back there. And that may be serving as a home for things that at some point could possibly blow up on me. So um, again, one of those tasks that I'm gonna have to go after at some point. So, uh, with that being said, if there are some diseases that you would like uh, to see more elaborate or a greater discussion on, mention them in the comments. If I know about them, I will go ahead and, and either release a video or bring it up in the next live stream, or I will go ahead and I will do some research. I will be your Google. <laughs> and sometimes I do get, uh, you, know, you, you want me to put it all out there, put it out there honestly? Sometimes someone will ask me a question and I'll go and I'll think to myself, you could Google this and have an answer in about two seconds. You could, but you know what? There's the part of me that likes to help tells that part of me to shut up. And I go ahead and I, 
Google it and I answer the person and, and uh, maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm stupid. So uh, <laughs> so at any rate, let let's get into um, some of the comments that were made last week, and uh, we had some uh, we had some good comments, including that very provocative one from uh, from Sharpies, and uh, which got me going, got me put me on a roll. But let let me uh, read some of these things from last week, and then I'll, then I'll roll back and I'll roll back and look at some of the comments today. Let me see if I can do. Let me check one thing real quick. If some of you folks have super chatted and I've missed it, I have not been ignoring you. I have just been rambling on and on and not even looking at the comments. Let's see here. Let me just go through here and... Boy, the chat has been very active. S-E-K, Aquador Deep uh, 50. Aquador Deep, thank you so much, my friend, for that. Very appreciated. Evening, Ben, here is for some medication for the fish. Uh, keep on filming. You are the king. <laughs> the king. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you very much. The king. Okay. So... <laughs> All right, so I think that's the super chats. If I miss somebody, I'm sorry. You know, I'll catch you later. All right, so um, let's take a look here at some of the comments last week, and then I'll get into this week's comments. Um, this is my favorite part of the chat. You know that. My favorite part of the live stream. Let's see here. Mr. B, Mr. B's fish, Mr. B's fish and things. He shared out the live stream to fish tubers notifications. Mr. B's fish and things. Thank you so much for doing that last week. I hope you're here today and did that. Uh, Cichlid Center. Ben, have you ever kept a nano fish or a nano tank? Um, no, I haven't. I, um, hey, Kalers, I see that. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Kalers. Much appreciated. Uh, I, I haven't, but I'll tell you, this this little device that I got, this this little uh, cute hang-on-back filter might just inspire me to keep a, uh, a little nano tank. And um, you know what I'd like to do with a nano tank someday, and not even a, a necessarily a nano tank, maybe even something bigger, is to create a tank and I keep thinking about this. I just got to figure out when and how and, and uh, create a tank that has um, only snails and shrimp and uh, sponges and uh, no, no, no other filtration. I know some people are doing that out there and I've seen it where the plants, the plants are doing uh, all, mo most of the heavy lifting, you know, heavily planted and the plants are consuming the nitrates and, and uh, releasing oxygen and, uh, and something like that, and maybe try that first. Try that first on a nano, and really, really get the ecosystem going. Where I can show how, uh, maybe apart from just cleaning the front panel occasionally with a with you know with a pad, otherwise you don't need to do anything to it. And and it's got healthy shrimp and and snails and maybe a few little neon tetras in it or something like that. I think that'd be kind of fun. Um, so uh, no, I haven't, but I but I wouldn't mind. I, I wouldn't. Mind starting one, Nolan Raggio, Nolan Raggio or Nolan Reggio, Raggio. Hi Ben, what are good tank mates for Mabunas? Well, other Mabunas, I think, or uh, you're going to have to probably go with other Mabunas. I, I, um, I had them with peacocks, and some of you who are watching have have them with peacocks and haps, and and that system is working for you, and that's that that's good. It didn't work for me. It did reach a point for me where the where the Mabuna put on size and they became a problem for the peacocks uh, and uh, were being very aggressive. Uh, Mabuna are very uh, they're very husky, very strong fish, and very territorial. So um, I would say um, Mabuna should be kept probably with 
other Mabuna, but uh, prevent, you know, create lots of caves, you know, stack some caves up, create a condo, Mabuna condo. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, even between Mabuna, watch out, because I had a Pseudotrophius, beautiful Pseudotrophius, and I had to get rid of him because he was beating up other comparably sized and very different looking Mabunas. And the Pseudotrophius was, you know, you had, they had that big, strong head, you know, they look like they're wearing a helmet. And, uh, you know, he would, he would clear out the tank so nobody could eat during feeding. So he would get all the lion's share and then he would let other fish get a nibble here and there. He was just a beast, beautiful fish, purple and violet in his body, gorgeous fish. And, uh, but I took him to the, one day I just got frustrated, put him in a bucket, took him to the local fish store and said, here, he's yours. Um, so I would say Mabuna with Mabuna. That's just me. If you have a different opinion, you know, say it in the chat. And uh, which side is the chat? Is it that side? Anyway, everything is backwards on my terminals. Um, let's see here. Michael Nicholas has a question. He says, I have a six foot, 125 gallon tank looking into getting a wave maker to help move, uh, I guess, detritus from the sand and a little oxygenation, which size would you recommend? And one that would last? Well, uh, Michael, that depends on your budget. If you don't mind something big and bulky and that's inexpensive, you can pick up one of those uh, dual head Sun Sun you know, 1800 gallon per hour for under $20. And you can put uh, one of them uh, high up and one of them low, you know, one of them low towards the front on one side and one of them high towards the back on the other. And, and you can run them on a timer so that they run at the same time for about six or eight hours a day. And, and um, you'll have a lot of water circulation, you'll have oxygen and you'll have detritus that gets suspended and ideally ultimately sucked into the um, filter intakes. If your budget, if you have a high budget, if you want to spend some money, consider getting a uh, something like a Geyer. You know, one, these are the, uh, they look like logs, you know, they look like, like, uh, you know, logs that you hang up near the top of the tank and some of them have a rotate a rotating function. And they send a, a they send a sheet or a uh, wave a flat wave across the bottom of your tank and then up and then back and then up and they can do in some cases 15 2,000 gallons an hour or more you can put them on a timer uh, some of them have remote controls that you can use they're popular in the salt community where you need uh, circulation not just for oxygen and the moving of detritus but also for the life of the corals they need to have a lot of circulation. You have products like Tons, I think it's T-U-N-Z-E, products like um, like the Generation 3 high door that I have on this tank here. I have a high door that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, po uh, you know, power head wave maker. I have to actually look at it to make sure it's on because it makes zero noise, absolutely zero noise. And that's an indication of being well engineered. Whereas the Sun Suns do have a little bit of a hum. But if you have a bubble maker or something like that, it's going to it's gonna drown out the hum. But uh, the high door at third generation, where you can move the entire power head around, it actually detaches from the back. And you can move it all any direction you want. That's a very, I found that to be very, very good. So it depends on your budget. You're going to pay about 60 bucks. For the high door, you're going to pay 150 to 250 for the, for a Geyer system. You're going to pay $19, $15 for a Sun Sun. Uh, they'll all do a maybe a similar job. The Geyer will probably be the best. The high door second, tons, you know, the ton second. Uh, but um, yeah, look at the, if you want to know the spectrum. Go to places like uh, Chewy's and then go to places like Bulk Reef Supply, uh, BRS, Bulk Reef Supply, and look at what the salt water people are, are using. 
and you'll get the spectrum. Okay, you'll find you'll find lights that will do the job. Uh, among us fr freshwater guys, guys and gals, thirty, forty dollars. Go to the saltwater side. You know, a thousand dollars for your light setup. So, um, if you want to get an idea of what the spectrum is, go visit some of the salty sites. Uh, Viking Nation. The Vi Viking Nation asked uh, Viking Nation under the thumbnail when I when I when I said when I announced the video what keeps this tank pristine, the breakdown on the sump. Under that thumbnail, uh, Viking Nation guessed that it was Seachem Purigen. And uh, I just want to let you know that I stopped using Seachem about a year ago, Seachem Purigen. Now, in the very beginning, when uh, my tanks were first becoming established and I put Purigen in, it was, it was, like, it was like a miracle. I mean, literally, literally, it was like a miracle. The tanks became crystal clear. After the tanks became established, and in my own thinking, I started moving away from chemical filtration for just, I, you know, for just, just me. That's just me. I'm not poo-pooing it. It was just me. I, I went away from chemical for everything, charcoal, pyrogen, um, anything. I just went away from it. So, um, of course, right now I have Brightwell blocks in here, which you could make an argument is chemical filtration. And maybe you could make that argument with the Brightwell blocks. But uh, I had a period where I had to recharge the Purigen, and I couldn't get to it for over a week, and the tanks were still crystal clear and pristine. And so I said, hey, the tanks look without the Purigen, the way I would want to get them with the Pyrogen, I'm going to stop using the Pyrogen, and, and they've never become cloudy again. I will say that they helped in the beginning when the tanks were not established, but after they became established, I didn't use it anymore. So if you folks have some input on the idea of using Pyrogen, type it in the chat, please. I'd love to hear it. Uh, let's see. Under the video, under the posted video of last week's live stream, Remco Campius, Remco, K-A-M-P-H-U-I-S. Great live stream, Ben. The cycle continues to be a fascinating subject, no matter how experienced we are. I love seeing this tank in the background. He was talking about the 100. You have some beautiful fish in there. Can I please ask you, what are your thoughts on using live sand in a Malawi tank to buffer pH, prevent algae, and keep the cycle? Um, honestly, I'm not really sure what you're, when you say live sand, if you're referring to the kind of sand that comes already infused with um, beneficial bacteria, then, um, I've used that and I've had great results. I really liked it. I even bought sand one time that was for a saltwater tank. It was designed specifically for a saltwater tank with beneficial bacteria. Um, you know, it was wet, the bags, you know, the sand was wet and it, had, and it even had some additives that you would add to it once you put it in the tank. I called the company and I asked, can I use this with cichlids? Cichlids do have uh, a tolerance for salt they also, uh, there are some theories that cichlids actually, African cichlids were originally way thousands of years ago, saltwater fish that became separated from saltwater and gradually were, where they were became diluted into freshwater. And, uh, and so they have a high tolerance for salt. So the people at the company said, yes, you can use this, this live bacteria infused saltwater tank. Um, you can use that for your cichlids. And I did, and I had a very successful 135 gallon tank that you can see in some of my older videos. There's a little bit of a gray, gray colored substrate that I had that after I sold the tank and uh, threw the substrate in because I didn't want to scoop it out, 
in hindsight, I wish I had kept that substrate. They would have probably given me the same price for the tank. And, uh, uh, you know, it was a, uh, you know, it was, it was aragonite and aragonite, uh, which, which is just very good for Malawi tanks. It, it adds uh, calcium, magnesium, uh, helps to give you stability. Those, those minerals help to give you a stable pH. Uh, if I understand it correctly, nitrogen, nitri the, the, in, in the, you know, nit nitrates is nitric acid. It's an acid that becomes to some degree buffered or neutralized by minerals like magnesium, calcium, if I understand the process correctly. This is why you still need to do water changes even if, if, if you did get low nitrate levels in your readings, you should still do water changes because you need to, you need to add calcium, magnesium, you need to add fresh minerals because they're suspended in the water and over time they start to settle. And once they settle, you don't have that buffering anymore. And what can happen then is you can have a, a bit of a spike that can uh, that can be very, very de uh, detrimental. So anyway, Remco, if I understand your question, yes, uh, use, uh, you can use that, uh, you know, you can use that kind of substrate. And I hope I did understand the answer to your question. My peeps missed the live stream, but I believe Sharp, Sharpie's comment about bacteria is very true. I believe that is why sponge filters will do so well. My peeps is, of course, referring to the uh, troublemaker, uh, Sharpies. <laughs> and I say that with great affection, um, talking about how we might perhaps not need expensive, beneficial, uh, you know, you know, media for beneficial bacteria that in fact the substrate and sponges could do all the work that's needed and uh, so my peeps was agreeing with him and watch for an upcoming video on that subject steven uh, schulte ben what's your favorite hang on back filter uh you know my favorite is limited to uh the ones i have personal experience with which means that there may be some that are much better that I just haven't even tried. I've heard great things about the Fluval uh, hang on back. I've heard great things. Uh, uh, you know, I have right now a Marine land, uh, one of those Emperor 400 dual bio wheels that, you know, the, the damn thing just runs and runs and runs and runs. It just never it makes no noise. It moves a lot of water. I noticed a difference immediately when I put it on. God knows how long, how old it was when I got it because it was thrown into that old 135 I talked about a little while ago. And uh, I plugged it in after it sat in a closet for a year and, and it just fired right up and started running. And so that to me tells me a lot about a product, you know, when a, when a product can sit around like that. And uh, so I like the Marine Land. Um, when I first set up my 60, I, I had some Whisper, I think they were called Whisper 90s big giant, the biggest whisper hang on back. And man, those things moved a lot of water. Uh, they were noisy. The overflow was very high up. And so they were very noisy. And uh, I ended up transitioning into canisters because the, the tank was in a TV room and you had to turn the TV way up because of the splashing. But uh, anyway, so um, if you folks have a favorite hang on back, Filter, go ahead and you know comment below and and uh, and uh, mention what your favorite hang on back is. I've certainly heard good things about a lot of different ones out there, but uh, there's one that you can put a lot of media into, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, if you can put a lot of media into them, I love hang on backs because they they uh, break up the surface tension, so they give you lots of oxygen, and uh, they pull water. You know, when you when you hang when when you position the intake. You can position it very low. So they're pulling low oxygen water from the bottom and, and then and then re-oxygenating the water. So they're creating water movement, oxygenation, and uh, they're very easy to work on. You don't you don't even have to bend over. You just, you know, you just stand there and pull stuff out and put stuff in and rinse stuff in tank water and put it back in. And, and so they're, they're, they're very easy. You don't have to crack open a canister or, I mean, they're practically as easy as a sump to work on. They're basically a mini sump that's hanging on the back of your, 
of your aquarium. So I, I like them. I love hang on backs. But, you know, I like sponges and I like sumps too. You know, I like, I like them all. So um, Mark Hill, where do you buy your tanks? Uh, Mark, I, I've had good luck on Craigslist. Uh, let me see. I bought one from a local tank builder. The 60-gallon was a local tank builder, and I found him on Craigslist. Uh, gave me a really good deal for the tank and the stand and the lid. And, uh, you know, he builds them by hand and, and you know, warranties them, and, and the, the tank has been has been wonderful. Uh, his his uh, his handiwork, his seams were, were absolutely perfect. Just uh, So anyway, uh, that's where I picked up tanks. Uh, three of the tanks I have right now were off Craigslist. One of them was from uh, PetSmart. I think 38 was from PetSmart. Might have been a PetSmart tank. Sharpies, models, and aquatics. You always look good in pictures, Candy, especially next to Kevin. <laughs> I told you he's a troublemaker. Uh, Cichlid Center. Here's one thing I don't understand about the cycle. Say I have a tank with five fish for a couple months. If I add 10 fish and then three die because it was cycled for four fish, but not 14. Let me see. My last number was off, but you get the idea. Okay. So uh, if you, if you create, if you add more ammonia, I remember these fish are releasing that ammonia through their gills, right? I mean, not just urine and, 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 and poop. It, it's coming out of it. That's how they release ammonia. So they're, they're like little ammonia factories. So if you add a big ammonia factory that exceeds the, the amount of bacteria currently living in the tank, you're going to have a, um, you know, a spike, a momentary spike in ammonia and nitrite. So some of the fish that are more robust are going to be able to withstand that. The fish that are a little bit weaker are not. And so as the bacteria is adjusting to the new levels of ammonia, you're going to have a die-off in your fish. And so as the bacteria increases, the ammonia production will kill off fish. So you'll have this sort of point where they'll meet. And then you'll have balance again. Uh, one of you, and I think it was GP, Gurvinder Parmar, I think it was him, suggested that when you add a large number of fish like that, throw in a little bit of Fritz Turbo or a little bit of stability, a product like that, that adds some bacteria. My, my problem with those products is that if you add them to an empty tank, and nothing's feeding that bacteria, isn't that bacteria going to die? But this, under these circumstances of adding a large number of fish to an established tank and throwing in some turbo, some Fritz turbo or some Seachem stability, that bacteria you're adding, assuming the bacteria is truly alive and hasn't been sitting on a shelf for a long time and died off and all the other controversy you hear about that kind of bacteria, but assuming that it really is live bacteria, it's going to have food from that new fish that you've added. And so that may actually buffer or, or cut back on the shock that the, the fish will get or on the size of the sort of mini cycle that you're starting. Also, you know, adding, adding a, a prime, doing a water change, maybe uh, every other day or every day for a couple of days after the addition of the new fish. All of this can help when you add a large number of fish at once. The, uh, the rule of thumb for me is I keep it between, you know, four and six, four and six fish. It's very similar to uh, a tank that is under oxygenated. If your fish are, if their mouths are working, if they're hanging around the top, 
if they're not as colored up as they should be, there's a chance that they're under oxygenated. You'll find that out when you add an air stone uh, or, or a power head and break up the surface. All of a sudden you notice new, new vitality, new vitality, new color in the fish. You'll realize that they were under oxygenated. They were being choked a little bit. But what can happen is if, if you're very under oxygenated, you can have a die off right, until it meets the point of the level of oxygen that can be sustained, and then those fish will survive. But you've lost the fish, usually the bigger fish, the ones with the greater oxygen need will die off on you first. That's why uh, this kind of a product, like this, this cobalt rescue, uh, where I would use this product first, it's not cheap, so I'm not picking up 10 of them at once, but where I would use this product first would be in the tank behind me because these fish have a very large oxygen requirement. And so uh, if I had a power outage, that's where I'd want to have an air stone immediately kick in is in this big tank. Second pick would be the uh, 100 because it's so heavily stocked, but it's stocked with medium and smaller fish. So um, again, everything... Everything in your tank is constantly trying to find a balance. Oxygen, ammonia, nitrite, bacteria, it's all working constantly on a balance. And if you're on top of it, you'll, you'll know where that balance is. If you're doing testing and things of that nature, you'll find a, you know, you'll keep an eye on that balance. It's when that balance goes off because we fail to do uh, maintenance or we, we did something silly. Uh, that's when you have the, the horrible, including disease because disease very often uh, has pre, it has a precursor, it has a predisposition factor in disease. The predisposition factor in disease is for fish usually is stress. And stress could be uh, induced by aggression. It can be induced by uh, parameters changing, rapid changes in pH, temperature, uh, tank mates, uh, things of this nature, poor quality food, uh, large amounts of waste in the tank. All these things are precursors or predisposition uh, factors for disease. So um, there you go. So let's see here. Nit, nit, nitney, nittany fins. Have you compared your nitrates before and after you added the algae scrubber? I was doing it on a pretty regular basis, and I did find that it was helping. Uh, the large, uh, the very large algae scrubber on the 100, I found was putting uh, was keeping me at around between 10 and 20, 10 and 20 uh, in in nitrates in that tank. That algae scrubber is loaded with green, deep green algae, so much so that when I when I open it up prior to servicing it. When I open it up, I leave it open in the tank for several hours, and I let the the fish actually gorge themselves on algae, the pleco, the clown uh, loaches, uh, the um, ruby red loves it. The um, they just love the algae in it, so they'll peck at it for a couple hours. I'll let the uh, pleco clean the wall. The pleco will make the wall pristine because algae does grow on the wall where the algae scrubber is. So I'll let them eat that up because it's nutrient rich. And then I'll go ahead and clean it up and put it back on. So it is doing, I think, a great job. And uh, I would highly recommend. They're from Santa Monica Filtration. They did send me those algae scrubbers uh, to do reviews on them. Uh, full disclosure, they were provided to me for free. So um, I found that it did work. So I would, I would recommend them if you don't mind the way they look. This tank has two of them. They're in the sump, so you don't see it. Another big advantage of a sump is that you can hide equipment like heaters, algae scrubbers, things like that. So I am a big believer in algae. Uh, it is nature's way of controlling nitrates, just like plants. Plants are nature's way of consuming nitrates, releasing oxygen, and in some cases providing a source of nutrition uh, for, food, for uh, the fish, especially with algae. A Kristen Kirby, I just take stuff out of other tanks a few weeks before I add fish and then put in the new tank. Uh, Kristen, Kristen, that's the way to go. 
I find the best, uh, the best way to rapid cycle a tank is to bring in uh, substrate, filter media, sponges uh, from an established tank and put them in there. That's the, that, is, that has worked the best for me in getting a new tank or a quarantine tank or a hospital tank started has been the bringing over stuff from an established tank. And uh, so, yes, 100% on that. Sean's Aquarium. You should make a video on the best substrate to use in a cichlid tank. Um, Sean, I think I do have a, a video on substrate. I think it's titled, which, which is best or I forget. I'd have to look in my, in my video list, but I do have one on substrate. Um, you know, I, I like, I like this, this uh, coral for the buffering. I love seeing the, the cichlids pick up pieces of it and carry it around, you know, big chunks and walk, you know, go around with it especially when they do a snowstorm on one of the other fish. You love a fish down below and a fish will drop a mouthful of coral and it comes, <laughs> it's like a snow globe. But um, if you, if I was starting a tank right now, a cichlid tank, I would use, um, I would use aragonite. Aragonite would be my, my first pick. Now, some of you might argue that aragonite isn't even needed in Southern California because we have liquid rock coming out of our faucets. We have very hard water coming out of our faucets. I do like something that adds calcium, adds magnesium to the water for the sake of stability. So uh, I think aragonite would be my number one pick. If I lived, uh, I could get away with uh, blasting sand or play sand. However, I have heard uh, some folks talk about how those products can have sharp edges and over time be an abrasive on the lips and also the gills of the fish because they do release some of the sand that way as well. Um, but I think um, I think aragonite would be my number one pick for cichlids, followed closely by some type of a of a beach, you know, like a regular sand. Like the 100 has regular black beach sand. That's like a product I picked up on the internet from um, Imaginarium. And it's a beautiful black sand. Knight Rider. What's your white whale? A really difficult find species that you are keeping an eye out for. Knight Rider, what's your white whale? I call that Knight Rider, I call that unicorn fish. What's my unicorn fish? And if I had to pick a unicorn fish, it would be a uh, fully... Uh, colored up, fired up, large male uh, Nimbochromus uh, linny. I had a linny and he was beautiful and I, I uh, lost him a while back. He was developing very nicely with great shape and patterns, but I did end up losing him. I think uh, he may have gotten some internal issue, but he, he, uh, he was never really robust. He was never really a very active and strong fish. And I think the other fish might have overwhelmed him a little bit. But a, uh, a, a nice big linny would be nice, uh, something like that. It'd be maybe uh, a fully colored up, uh, a fully colored up uh, Bucanono, Bucachromus nodotania. I have one behind me. You can see him right, right there. I'm backwards and upside down here, so bear with me. It's like working in the mirror. Um, I'm not sure if he's a male or if she's a male. I'm not sure if it's a male. I'm waiting. I'm praying for a little for a little point on the anal fin, a little uh, peak on the dorsal, something to give me a sign that it's a male. But a fully colored up uh, Bucachromus nodotania is, in my mind, one of the most beautiful freshwater fish. They are uh, sort of a bioluminescent, crazy. Anyway, so there. That's my that's my white whale unicorn. And uh, for now, it could be different. You know. Let me see. Michael Nicholas, Michael Nicholas, if you're on the stream, speaking of sumps, do you have absolutely, do you absolutely have to drill a hole in your aquarium? Absolutely not. You can use an overflow box. An overflow box, I believe, uh, 
ESOP and other uh, you know companies make overflow boxes. If you go to BRS, Bulk Reef Supply, they have videos on using overflow boxes. And basically all they are is a hang on back filter. But instead of having the motor on the hang on back filter, you have a hose that goes down to a sump and the motor is located then in the sump. So, and it pushes the water back to the tank. So you're using an overflow box with some, with some, uh, with like a sponge in it, usually as a pre-filter, goes down to a tank or something that you might have set up yourself, and uh, or, you know, you can buy a, a high end like an ESOP sump, and uh, and it, you have the pump there pushing the water back up. Now uh, you have to be really really precise in how you set them up, <clears throat> so that in the event of a pump failure. Uh, you don't end up draining the tank and overflowing the sump. But there are several ways you can do that, and uh, including by drilling a hole just below the water line of the, retur you know, of the return. Uh, there's ways of setting up tubing that will break the siphon in the event of, uh, of, of a pump failure. So anyway, you just have to make sure you set them up correctly, but you, you don't have to drill your tank. Bronze Seeker, any tips on treating sunken belly? Bronze Seeker, be sure to watch my next video called Something is Wrong. <clears throat> it's, it'll be uh, posted tomorrow morning at uh, 3 a.m. Pacific time. I'm going to talk about using uh, Metro, Metro and Focus, a couple of products I just got in the mail yesterday from my friends at Super Cichlids. And um, I'll be talking about the treating of sunken belly. I've also heard a third thing that should be that it was suggested uh, was a nutrient called nourish, which you also add to the uh, concoction. You you soak your food in it, in in the focus, the metro, and nourish, and this makes sure that the fish is getting uh, with the food uh, very valuable nutrients that can also strengthen the fish and help them to win the battle if in fact they have they have uh, parasites. Let's see what else. It looks like GP was putting a plug in for a Geyer, a Geyer uh, powerhead. Uh, very, very powerful, uh, very effective, and but on the expensive side. So again, it's if it's in your budget. And IB, IB people, IBPPL uh, commented, I use a Hydro Corella, uh, Corellia Wave Maker, five years, still going strong. The Hydro, uh, the Hydro power heads are very, very smooth, very strong, very well engineered. And uh, one of the tests of how well engineered they are is that when they work, you don't hear a single sound and they push a lot of water. One word of caution on any power head or wave maker. Every month or so, or maybe six weeks or, or two months at the most, probably every two weeks in a saltwater tank, you have to pull them out and give them a good cleaning. Some of you watching right now have probably had power heads running for years and have never cleaned them. Apparently, based on some research that was done, within a month, they lose up to 30% of their gallons per hour as they become a little bit mummed. You know, as they get mummed and, and build up, they lose uh, their GPH, their gallons per hour. Pull it out, uh, you know. Take the cover off, pull out the impeller, give it all a clean clean up, put it back together, put it back in. It'll take you 15 minutes, and you'll be back to new, and you'll be back to your uh, factory spec on uh, how much water it can push. But uh, I mean, think about it: 30%. That's a huge decrease, and I think it gets worse after that. So um, get to get the full value of your power heads and wave makers do pull them out and clean them up from time to time. And as if we don't have enough, we already need to do. <laughs> Here comes Ben giving me more work. All right, let's look at some of your current comments. Let's see if something jumps out at me. And you know, if it if I don't take up your comment, don't hate on me. I'm going to be, I'll, I'll catch it in the next live stream. Let's see here. Let's see. 
I'm catching some of the late comments in the stream. Uh, Daniel Barrett, I use garlic guard when feeding medicated foods. Yes, garlic guard is good. Gar they, uh, fish, they find the, the garlic irresistible. And I'll tell you something funny, so do I. <laughs> if you want to medicate me, put some garlic on my food. <laughs> Love the garlic. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Bruno Lobo, it's nice you talk about sunken belly. I have a case right now. I'm sure he's sick because he spits out dry food. Well, that's one of the symptoms you look for. You look for the um, uh, you know, inactive, uh, clamped fins. Is he spitting out food or not eating? And also um, and also look for look at the poop. See if the poop is is very stringy, you know, very, very uh, you know, almost in some cases, a transparent and stringy poop. These are signs that you have a parasite and uh, you need to start treating them right away. Uh, uh, do, you know, watch my video tomorrow, do a little research on uh, uh, removing parasites. There's other products out there you can use, uh, you know, look into it. And, but it does sound like he is sick. Some people's talking about using Canaplex. Let's see here. All right, I'm, I'm cycling through your comments. Looks like John and Angie Hoxie asked about a uh, current USA with a broken remote. I really can't comment on that. If some of you folks can give them a little help, uh, certainly contacting current USA would be my first guess. But uh, it looks like they have a broken remote and can't reset it. I hope it's not stuck on the storm setting. Okay, let's see. Chris Musner, Musner, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Chris. I think of ick like a cold. All are carriers, but some have a stronger immune system and don't become effect. Keeping good water and filtration will keep their immune systems on high. Uh, I agree, Chris. That is your first and best treatment is uh, pristine conditions, as pristine as you can provide to them. And, um, and if it does flare up, knowing what to do, and also knowing that, uh, I, as far as I know, if they've had ick, they have built some immunity to it, at least that kind of ick. Uh, and so they are, they're probably less likely to, to uh, have a bout of ick again. So in my case, uh, I do have a video out on how I beat ick. I, I used uh, the Cordon uh, ick product and um, ick attack. I also raised the temperature to gradually to about 85 degrees and left it there for about a week and then gradually reduced it back and the ick was all gone. I didn't lose any fish. Uh, sometimes people get on me because I keep clown loaches in with my uh, cichlids and um, these are uh, clowns I believe that have been bred in captivity for many, many years. So I'm not sure if they need as much of a soft water condition as you would imagine. However, uh, one of the reasons, one of the things I like that, uh, having them in the tank is they are a bit of a early warning system. If you have, uh, you know, a little teeny trace of ick in your tank, it's going to show up first on, on the clowns. And last time what happened is the clown had, and because they have the black stripes, it's almost like they're ick stripes. The black stripe on the clown gets a little spot, another little piece of uh, salt, right? Like a little piece of salt on it, another piece of salt. Boom, raise the temperature. Uh, you know, 85 degrees, uh, throw a little bit of ick, ick attack in there, gone, gone within 48 hours. It, you know, it's like, uh, and no chance for the ick to reproduce. Let's see here. Uh, just anything else here? Do you keep any females? Joshua. 
uh, Kuntz, K-O-C-O-O-N-T-Z. Hey, Ben, do you keep any females or received a female by mistake? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I refuse to make a joke uh, about that comment. I'm not going to make a joke about that comment. It would be very off color. And um, have you? I have received females by mistake, but I'll tell you how I've received them. I've received them by somebody selling me uh, what they thought was a male and turned out to be female. Uh, pri this happened primarily with um, Tampa Bay cichlids. It happened with Tampa Bay cichlids probably three or four times. And by the time you find out it's a female, the other fish have grown. And then when it replaces the one that was a female, it's teeny. And so you got to have another tank to grow that one out and hope that one's a male and Forget about that uh, guaranteed male when they're a half inch. It ain't going to happen. It's a 50-50 crapshoot. That's how I've received uh, females uh, in the past. I try and keep the tank behind me all male. Uh, I don't know if that Bucanono is a male. We'll see. I will say this. When I removed when I removed the Malawi hawk and put that Malawi hawk in the 30-gallon in the, uh, th uh, as part of the breeding project, the tank behind me calmed down. It calmed down a bit. And I, I think possibly because I removed some of the female hormones that were in the tank. That is a possibility. So um, let's see here. Bruno Lobo, some of Boone in my experience are less territorial like uh, the Honghi or Metra Aklima and have all species on African lakes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was my experience. I had one that, that was very territorial and very aggressive, and the other ones were kind of mellow. The, the, the lab, the electric yellow, the, the uh, yellow, and the yellow tail were kind of mellow, actually, compared to, the, to that one beast. And certainly the erratus, I had an erratus for a while, and you know, I always make jokes about erratus, you know, run for your life, hide the children, you know, erratus. Uh, but uh, boy, that one was a beast. When he went from his yellow coloration and, and became uh, black uh, and, and, you know, matured into a, a male erratus, he became just an absolute, um, you know, he just became this, this, this machine, this destruction machine. He would just go around and just harass everybody 24 seven, never would calm down. Carl, I would suggest, uh, Carl Meyer, I would suggest to go right into a 125 if you can afford it. If not, get a 60 if you're going to get into cichlids because eventually you're going to get there anyway. And people that tell me they're, they're getting into cichlids and they and they have a a, a 40 or a, or a 60 gallon, I tell them to start putting money aside for the 125 because that's where they're going. And uh, you, 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 it's it's inevitable. Okay, let's see here. I see that you folks are getting into some great conversations with each other. I love to see it. Helping each other out. We all learn from each other, right? We all help each other out. And Adam C. Adam, great to see you on the uh, on the live stream. If you're still there, I agree on the Pyrogen. I'd use it in a hang-on back filter, maybe in but not in a canister, too big of an annoyance to open the canister to recharge. Yeah, yeah, canisters do have that, That uh, you know, you've got to crack them open, you've got to take them apart, you have to disassemble and reassemble them. And that is my biggest complaint probably about canisters in general. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the recharging process. At first I wouldn't recharge, I would just reorder pur Purigen. And then I, I tried recharging and it was very easy and I was very successful at it. So I just started recharging it. But then after a while, like I said earlier, I just stopped using it. So, um, but good to see you here, Adam C. If you came in late, I did mention your last video on how you soak food and how soaking the food has helped you to not have, not have a, uh, not have bloat in your tank. I thought that was good. Joshua made a comment about Zenzo. Is Zenzo on the live stream? 
If he is, welcome Zenzo. Zenzo is a moderator at the Ben O'Cichlid uh, Facebook group page, along with uh, Kevin Green and Denny. I'm going to go right to the... Okay, so if you folks have any questions you'd like to ask me right now, go ahead and type them in because I am in the uh, present. I am in the... I've caught up here. Joshua Koontz again. Hey, Ben, love. Love you. Love the show. First-time caller, long-time listener. Have you found a way to grow anaerobic bacteria? If so, how did you accomplish this seemingly impossible task? Uh, that is, uh, Joshua, the holy grail for uh, many fish keepers. And I have not been able to do what is sometimes referred to as a complete cycle, where you get the nitrates to actually be consumed and uh, go down to zero uh, without doing anything to the tank. There are some uh, videos on YouTube where some folks, uh, one fellow in particular talks about how uh, by using a very large amount of Biohome Ultimate, he was able to finally get a tank to measure zero nitrates on a consistent basis. You still need to change the water. You will never be free of water changes uh, for a variety of reasons. I think one of them, of course, is to add fresh uh, min minerals that are suspended in the water column. So you're not going to be uh, completely free of, of that, but you will be able to uh, create a setup where you don't have to worry about nitrates. And um, assuming that that person's uh, video was uh, legitimate and accurate, which I have no, no reason to believe it wasn't, he did mention that he was not provided by a home, uh, you know, by Richard, uh, by the owner of Biohome. And so, um, and Richard says, uh, uh, you know, Richard Threw over at Biohome says he has been able to accomplish it. What I have discovered is that you do need a considerable amount of biohome to make it happen. I could possibly fit that much biohome in the first chamber of my canister if it was all biohome. Uh, it would probably be $100 in biohome. If I'm going to be doing water changes anyway, I'm not sure if I want to go that direction. And uh, it, 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 so there are some folks that have achieved it. I have not. I don't see it discussed on a regular basis in the fish keeping community. Certainly those with heavily planted tanks, which has not been possible for me as a cichlid keeper. My tank, my you notice I have all plants behind me that are artificial from a company called a company called Elite Cichlids. Those are all artificial plants. My experiment with live plants was a disaster. Uh, they were destroyed by the cichlids. So um, at any rate. That's my two cents on the uh, a tank that fully cycles. And let's see, did I miss any super chats? If I did, I'm sorry. Ooh. IB people, IBPPL says, if you use a temp controller, secure the cord, my suction cup failed and the sensor came out of the water, went to 100 degrees, lost all rainbows. Surprisingly, my shrimp and autosynclus survived. That's a good point. And occasionally uh, take the suction cup of any suction cup that you're using, uh, pull it off, clean it because it gets mulm, clean the surface of the tank and then restick it to make sure it's secure. And uh, I've never even thought about that as a, uh, and it says that then the tank went to 100 degrees. The, I, the takeaway on that comment for me would be, first of all, set your heater, set your heater thermostat at um, 85 and set your controller, you know, set your controller at uh, 80, 81. So the heater is on when the, you know, it's on when the when the tank is cooler than you want it to be, but uh, can would only go up to 85. Then the heater thermostat would kick in. It sounds like you had your heater thermostat way way up, and um, and I'm not sure why. Uh, or maybe you have a heating element that has no thermostat and was relying exclusively on the controller to control it. 
But yeah, set the heater thermostat maybe five degrees above where you have your controller set at. Uh, otherwise, yes, you can get a runaway like that. Uh, you can even have a controller fail and then the heater would go into a runaway and, and uh, cook your fish. So um, a couple lessons from that. And I'm very sorry that happened to you, IB people. That's, that's horrible to, you know, to have that happen. And Josh also mentioned that he learned the hard way on on nitrates crashing, a cycle, rest in peace, Venusis. Yeah, I tell you, there isn't anybody on the stream right now that hasn't had lessons that were uh, learned and ingrained in us uh, because of a uh, hard a hard knock. And that happens, that happens to all of us. And uh, there's no one out there that is immune to it. And uh, some of us have lessons that are in our future and uh, all we can do is do the best we can, keep our fingers crossed and uh, stay on top of it. But, you know, there's usually a takeaway. There's usually a takeaway and, and sometimes those takeaways are painful and expensive. In some cases, they knock people out of the, the, the hobby. Uh, that's my biggest complaint with, um, with the, the big box stores. I was talking about this with my wife this morning about having a shared uh, filtration system and, and fish that are obviously diseased in one tank. And what they should be doing is doing a mass quarantine, treating the system, putting up a sign that's saying temporarily not selling fish. Wait until it's eradicated and then go ahead and, uh, and, and start selling fish again. Uh, why? Because a new fish keeper takes home their first fish and are so excited. Within a day, it's covered in ick and it dies. And there you go. We're killing off the future of the hobby. And that's my biggest complaint with uh, any, any fish store that would sell sick fish to the public and not at least have a temporary quarantine. I would respect them more if they didn't sell fish for a week with a sign that said, currently treating tanks, come back in a week. I would respect that a lot more. Unfortunately, sometimes you will find that companies will put profit ahead of common sense and ahead of honesty and everything else. And so uh, that's my two cents on that. So um, it looks like we have over 100 viewers. I am very pleased that we're averaging over 100 now. I thank all of you for sitting in. Anyone whose super chat I didn't acknowledge and thank, I'm sorry, I'll catch you next week, I promise. Anyone whose comments I missed, I will catch you next week, I promise. And if it's a comment that I feel I can uh, say something intelligent about, I want to thank all of you for sitting in. You are very, very appreciated. Thank you to my moderators, uh, you know, Danny and Kevin and Candy. You folks are the best. Thank you to all of you who take your time on Saturday to tune in. You are very appreciated. You rock, my friends. And uh, I believe that's all for me. And uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure speaking with you on Saturdays. I'll keep doing this as long as I can. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much.